please continue enjoying your lunch, but uh, we're going to get started. And it uh, looks like it was a pretty good lunch, too. Hmm. Very good. Um, welcome and welcome, Leonard Downey. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. I, I hope you'll have me back when my book comes out. Ah, well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, no, I have a plan here. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to say what I'm thinking. Um, but um, uh, have you had enough applause yet? Do you want some more? Uh, no, it's all right. Well, okay. fine, sure. Okay, all right, all right. Come on, come on. Why not? I mean, it's not every day that you win the most Pulitzers the Post has ever won in right. one shot, right? So yes. I would say enjoy it. Um, what was it like? I mean, given our, I think our generations are probably pretty much the same, did you, and, and we sort of grew up with the Pulitzers, did you ever think you would be winning in a group that included Bob Dylan? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I didn't think that. And I never expected this many, obviously. What's really gratifying is that it's many different kinds of journalism. Everything, everything that we do in the newspaper and involve more than 100 staff members in all these various projects. Uh, and that's, uh, it, that's exciting. The breadth of it is exciting. It's not just one event, but it's, it's a lot of different things. Who, who are the people who won? Uh, well, first of all, there's the entire, much of the staff of the newspaper that covered the tragedy at Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. the Do they there. each get a little Pulitzer? No, no, that's a group effort and their editor will get something. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Does he get to take, he or she get to take it home? Uh, yes, but, they, but there's okay. also a $10,000 prize with that. And as they announced uh, on the day that the award was announced, they're going to give that $10,000 to uh, one of the funds for the families of the Virginia oh, Tech students. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, and that's a, 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 by a unanimous vote of the editors and reporters mm -hmm. that worked on that story. Uh, I'm then, sure you'll show uh, them your appreciation in a. Uh, we, we have ways. We have ways. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and, uh, and then, of course, Dana Priest and Ann Hull That's and right. a photographer, Michael Ducille, mm -hmm. uh, won the uh, Pulitzer Gold Medal for public service. That's always my favorite award because public service is what we're in this business for, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the Walter Reed articles. Right. And right. in that case, there is no money because there's a gold medal that the newspaper gets. Uh, this will be our fourth gold medal in the history of the Washington Post, which is the most ever for a newspaper. What are the reporter and photographer? And they get little glass things that little say that they've won the, <laughs> that they've won the, uh, pull, okay. the gold medal. It's uh, probably fine. Uh, right. And then um, uh, Steve Fainaru, uh <laughs> won a uh, Pulitzer Prize for foreign reporting. Uh, for the reporting he did on these private contractors in Iraq mm -hmm. uh, and the way in which some of them have run amok. Right. Reporting that he began before the famous Blackwater What was that incident. category? That's a particular... That, that's foreign correspondence. Right, yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, risking his life and doing really incredible reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets $10,000 and mm -hmm. a plaque and that's a sweet. thing to put on the wall. Uh, and um, Gene Weingarten won for that remarkable tour de force that he did in having Joshua Bell, the virtuoso violinist, right. come and play in a metro station and right. be ignored by everybody. Yeah. Uh, no and, bobbleheaded dolls involved. No, though. no. <laughs> and you may want to you, you can still watch that video on the, yeah. on the Internet, which is uh, on our website, which is priceless. Uh, and um, Steve Perlstein, uh, who's our, uh, I, I called him a scold the other day in the newsroom. He normally was scolding his editors, like me, uh, for not nice doing things the way he on. thinks they ought to be done. But he also scolds the entire financial world regularly. And he was right. He was way ahead on the repercussions on the, of, uh, of the subprime mortgage lending. This is the category I was... <clears throat> that's, what, that's commentary. Or for was writing it explanatory? Columns. Did they use no, that word no, on it? No, commentary, commentary for that. Commentary, okay. And uh, that's for column writing. And right. he's the first financial columnist in history to win the Pulitzer Prize in that oh, category. That's, that is so that's really, that's very nice. And unfortunate that he was right, but yes, uh, that's right. incredible report. So I've left somebody out of that, haven't I? Is that out of the five? Hmm? 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 I, hmm? The Cheney, uh, the, the Cheney stories. stories. Yes, Thank yes. you very That's much. Good readers. We you know like that, you. Could, could that, yes, yes. Could that be because one of the reporters is now at another paper? Well, but that just that just happened. In fact, in fact, she finished working on that series while she was at the New yes, York Times. Right. Uh, her, she, Which is she, interesting. Well, I, she married I, a New York Times reporter, so, so that makes it they okay. They lived apart for a while. It drove her crazy, so she had to move to New York. Uh, but we, we'll still get her back somehow. I mean, I don't know, you know, if her husband disappears in the middle should, of the night, we should say her you know where to come. Right. We should say her name. Yeah, her, na her name is Joe Becker. Right. Her husband's name is Serge Kovaleski, right. or known as the traitor in our newsroom. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I owe that to my wife. Who, but, uh, but you've done your throwdown, so, yes. you know, now he's on notice. Right. And Bart Gelman is the still mm -hmm. Washington Post reporter mm -hmm. working on that. And that was remarkable. I, that was actually an assignment for me. 
because I, I wanted to know, I thought our readers wanted to know, how did Dick Cheney really operate in this administration? There was this thing that, you know, he was like the substitute president, which is not so. The president makes his own decisions. But Cheney had a way of working his will within the administration. And we wanted to figure out how that would happen. And it was really hard work. Uh, in fact, at first, Bart didn't like that assignment because mm -hmm. he thought it would be very difficult to do. But uh, they were remarkable reporters, and they were able to show us with a number of specific examples in different areas, the environment and business and, uh, and, and uh, terrorism policy, uh, in which he showed how Dick Cheney worked as well within the administration. As an editor, have you found sometimes that uh, in handing out assignments, have reporters often come back to you in the assignments that they didn't want from you were the ones that turned out to make an enormous difference that, for that, them? That's sometimes the case. Um, but sometimes we have stupid ideas, too, editors do. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're ignored, and that's good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's sort of like working for Richard Nixon. You, know, you can't do everything <laughs> do he tell. says. Uh, so, um, uh, but, uh, so those uh, are but the, the best. But much of the best of the journalism actually comes from reporters themselves. We try to hire journalists who are not just self-starters, but really creative in their approach to journalism, really enterprising. Because when you're sitting in an office like I am, you may have occasionally a good idea, like what's Dick Cheney really doing? Yeah. But most of the time, you don't know what's really going on. They do. They find it out, and they bring it to us. Was there a kind of redemption in this? I mean, in that you oh. have been, um, not just your paper, your industry, even you, <clears throat> In the in the in the in the mix so much lately as uh, an industry on the ropes, ah, uh, a profession right. that's changing, rumors that you're taking a buyout, you know, so much that was probably heavy, and things you didn't want to comment on, or if you had to comment on, it wasn't always with good news. Right. And then uh, Monday, that's sure. what I mean by redemption. Uh, but yes, but of course, this is an industry in enormous transition. I think that. Oddly enough, the journalism about a lot of this is overly negative because uh, we're just talking about this at our table. Newspapers are not going to disappear. This newspaper is not going to disappear. Right. But it's evolving. More of our readership now is on the Internet than in print. That's not a bad thing. It means our readership is larger than ever. These stories that won the Pulitzer Prize had millions of page views mm -hmm. on the web. They were read by more people than would have read Pulitzer Prize winning journalism 10 years ago. That is a good thing. But getting from one place to another involves a lot of change. And change can often be difficult and scary. And economically, figuring out what the model is is very difficult and has been, and has been a problem for many newspapers. And we're having to downsize some, too. But we're still going to have a large staff. But you're right. This was a really a great affirmation that we're on the right mission in what we're doing at the Washington Post, so you can still do mm -hmm. this kind of journalism in this climate. Uh, the, the, the Washington Post would, would probably survive in this climate. You, you could probably keep, even, even if it wasn't profitable, the company's so big, you could keep publishing a newspaper. Yeah, we with, like being in the education business. Yes, well, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but what about all the other smaller newspapers that don't have the resources of the yeah. Washington Post or the New York Times. Right. Do you see a time where they're going to be fewer and fewer? I, I'm very, very worried about that. It's not so much the small ones. Still, small community newspapers have such a strong local advertising yeah, base and less overhead viable. than we do right. here okay. uh, that they're going to be fine. It's the ones in the middle. It's those other metropolitan dailies from Philadelphia to Miami to San Francisco and San Jose where their staffs have been cut in half, their circulation has been cut in half, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm worried about them now. How, whether they'll, I think any city is going to have to have some newspaper in it. But what kind of newspaper it's going to be, what kind of journalism it's going to be doing, that's an issue. In a, in a, in a few weeks, I'll be going to uh, to Berkeley, where Lowell Bergman uh, is holding a seminar on investigative journalists, and all the big editors and the big newspapers are going there. Lowell and, Bergman, and, who was with 60 Minutes, yeah, was with 60 famously. Minutes, right? And so we're going to be talking about this because you know, New York Times, Bill Keller will be there for New York mm -hmm. Times, and and the, and the guy who runs 60 Minutes will be there and so on. We're okay. Mm -hmm. But the subject of this will be, what about everybody else? Are we going to still be able to do this kind of journalism? I was saying at our table that the most important thing to me about American journalism is accountability reporting, mm -hmm. holding the powerful accountable. That's not going to happen on your average local television station, which doesn't have enough reporters to do that. Yeah. It's not going to happen on your major news networks that have to worry about ratings with the exception of something like 60 Minutes. It's going to happen in newspaper newsrooms, however it is that we project our journalism. You're, you're going to like walking into that uh, meeting, that, 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 that <laughs> assembly that Lowell Bergman's bringing together. It'll, it'll be fun, It's going to be yeah. a sweet moment. Uh, but does... Um, the, the revenues that you lose in advertising and, and, and the print newspaper, uh, does it get made up for in the money that's the advertising on the web? Somewhat. Not completely. That's the problem. 
uh, the uh, the web advertising is growing at a time when the print news news advertising is shrinking, but, but the not growth, at the same but the growth, rate. yes, not, it's not a one for one substitution, and that's what we're working on, is how do we deal with that? So if you're a, if you're a, if you're a smaller paper and you don't have that web component or the potential for the web component to become to become strong, uh, could there could there this is a crazy hypothetical? Could there be a time when you just didn't even have a Washington Post newspaper, or it was on demand? I, you know, I can't see that. Obviously, I'm of an age where I only can see so far out in the future, but I I, I just can't see that. I, I, there's a there's a unique. You know, we talk about technology. Mm -hmm. There's a unique technology to a print newspaper. I mean, it's very low tech, mm -hmm. but it is very handy in lots of different ways. From being able to rip it out to take different sections and well, and, and especially once and so you on. solve the problem of it not coming off on our yeah, hands. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a huge right. development. We've, we, yeah, we've improved that a lot. But it, but I, and so it, it, there are young readers of newspapers. Now they're also reading. You're kidding. Us, no, I'm not Who kidding. are they? Yeah, uh, they're, they're they're around. We, we do surveys. There's not one in my house. Yeah, I well, mean, I, I, yeah. I wonder how. We'll do work you, on that. Well, I, you know, I wonder if it needs to be smaller or something. I just oh, uh, the, uh, the is getting smaller for one thing. In uh, size. In size, yes. Yeah. We, we've gotten smaller in size, and we'll probably get still more smaller in size. You want to be as convenient as possible, and you want to not spend as much money on newsprint. So it'll continue to change form, and 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 what we we put in print is evolving too. It's the more deeper stories in print. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's comics in print, which are not so much fun to look at online as they are in print. It's a, it's a whole variety of things that are unique to print that we're trying to focus on mm -hmm. in print. And then on the web, and then later on handheld devices, we're focusing on the things that work best on those. Somebody wanted to know when's Doonesbury coming back? I think we, we say in the paper all the time, it's a six-week hiatus. It's like this, you know, like hold that. your breath, he'll be yeah. back, don't. Yeah, right. That's, so that's we're the trying way to up your value, right? Go right. away for a little while and have everybody yeah. miss you. Yeah, and we're trying out other, it gives us an opportunity to try out some other comics in this place and see what but people Gary like. Gary probably doesn't want them to be too fabulous. Well, we would put them someplace else them if someplace. they're popular. Yeah, because the, the web doesn't have the comics, does it? It does, actually. The comics are on the web. You can look them up. You're kidding. But I like, didn't know that. And there are some people who read them regularly on the web, but by and large, people like to read comics in print. Uh, back to the Pulitzers. How did you find out? I can't tell you that. Oh, come on. <laughs> you mean you knew before you were supposed to? Uh, yeah. We found out on Friday <laughs> after the board had made its decisions, but they keep it a secret until Monday. And yeah, that's so somebody all I'm on the board you. told you. I'm just, I'm all, that's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so um, how secret did you keep it? Oh, we kept it very secret except for the uh, Come winners. on, you had to tell we, somebody. No, we let the winners know. You did. Yeah, but they're not allowed to tell anybody other did than they, the that, family. Did that mean in the news? Or <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they don't. They did a good job of not this doing it. This is a clear example of the Washington Post having lost its deep throat polish. <laughs> 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 um, but, okay, so everybody knew, and so everybody pretended in the newsroom to be surprised, right? No, I mean, there were a lot of people were surprised because they didn't know, really. I mean, the winners, you, you like the winners to be prepared for what's going to happen to them on Monday. Okay. Uh, and you like to be Wear able to... Wear the right outfit. Yeah, and you, you like know, to be prepare ready. a good ceremony. But, um, <laughs> there, yeah, there were people who were surprised. Um, uh, when did Ben Bradley call you? Did he call you? He came down to see me. He came down. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yes. We like this. Right. And He uh, still has, by the way, Ben still has an office in the, in the building I upstairs. Know. And uh, he often comes to visit. And he I wonder sometimes if that, that was like being Princess Diana and having Camilla Parker Bowles around. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> which one was which there? I, uh, I, I realize I can't. Right. I can't touch <laughs> trying to figure out those relationships. Uh, but, uh, I can't take that too far now. Ben, I? ben when, I, when I succeeded him in 1991, he forbid himself from coming to the newsroom for quite a long time. So it wouldn't appear like he was looking over my mm -hmm. shoulder. And I, I just finally had to drag him in after a while because Ben and I are close and I'm my own person anyway and it didn't matter. So It's important, isn't it, nice to, to be your own person in that culture? Yes, it is. Especially that newsroom. Yes. And I, I think sometimes the rap on you is that people don't know that you are your own person. You know, it's like, because they say, well, he's such still water. Right. You know, nobody really knows Len. But uh, you are your own person, and it doesn't matter what Ben Bradley does, right? Yes, correct. Nice to have him correct. around. Right. Have you gone to him uh, at times and found important counsel from him? Uh, uh, yes, uh, usually on um, personnel matters. Mm -hmm. we, we, obviously, we deal with... I liken my job to, to being fortunate to be the conductor of an amazing orchestra full of amazing talents, nearly all of whom are not quite normal. 
Yeah. Uh, That's a good thing, right? And uh, otherwise, they'd be working, doing, making a lot of money someplace else. Right. And they'd be working for Kimsey or something. Yeah, yeah. But they do this because they have this, this, uh, you know, this, this sense of mission. Right. And uh, so they're they're a handful. Uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, with really talented people, you can have really difficult. Uh, problems to solve, right. and Ben was always helpful with that. Ben has really great intuition and feeling for people. That is the root of journalism, isn't it? You know, that rats in the guts, that, that wanting to do it. I mean, your job is not unlike the, the manager of a, of a baseball team or a football team. Yes. You're not only running the game that's on the field, but you're trying to recruit from the, from the farm team what you're bringing in. I'm assuming. Tell me yes. if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly and, right. And where are plus, you? Plus, we grow some of our own, too. We, I was a summer intern in 1964 and was hired is out of that class. Is that still the conventional way and, to get into the that post? That is still one of the ways to do it. We have hundreds of applicants for about 20 summer intern slots, and that allows us to pick you know, the best people. And if they do well in the summer, they've got a leg up in getting a job with us. And besides, we want some people that are you know, young in the newsroom, not just old nice. yeah. like me. <laughs> And, and you don't so want we, them all going across the river right, to exactly. dot com. Right. So we hired half a dozen of them probably out of every summer group. But the difference, I wonder, between when you were coming up and a summer intern and now is like they've all got multiple PhDs. Oh, right? it's amazing. I never would have been hired now as a summer intern. But is no, that a no, good no thing? chance. Is that a good thing, Lynn? Well, they don't all have multiple PhDs, but they all are really, really talented people. Right. And it's, some of them have, some of them are lawyers and occasionally they're a physician and, mm -hmm. and they're China experts and so on. Some of them are just you know, really talented. And we make sure that we have a mix of people. I come from a, a public university, Ohio State, mm -hmm. and I make sure that we have got some public university people there every summer too but they're just a really really talented journalists and uh, like I say it would have been pretty tough for me but we were hiring anybody back in the 60s so was <laughs> you didn't hire me no, no that's sorry. another story no it's actually I was thinking earlier why are you so nervous about this interview why are you so nervous and I thought I had this revelation it was because I did interview you once and you didn't hire me and I had to stay in television and oh, poo. but anyway I've forgiven you no it wasn't one of my better days but that's another story um, do do you find in the people that um, that you hire now that they come in with very specific ideas of what they want to do I mean are they coming in with specialties I mean, are, are, is there the, is, does the police beat exist in its classic oh, yes, old school that, form? Yes, it still does. And, and Marty got, Weil is probably Mar still Marty Weil is still there. <laughs> uh, he's a, for, Marty Weil is a classic newspaper rewrite man yes. who, uh, who wants to come in and have a clean slate every day when he comes in and do whatever's in front of him. It could be a big obituary. It could be re rewriting a big murder story or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then when he's finished at night, he goes home and nothing carries over. He's not like a beat reporter that has to worry about right. what am I going to do tomorrow in interviewing the mayor. And that Marty enjoys that, and that's he's great. He's an amazing talent, and he used to work for the CIA. And we're not sure if he's quit. Still, or not. well, we're let's hope. Sure. Let's hope he still so is. So we're we're careful with him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, but no, a lot of them do come with specialized backgrounds, but they're not going to do that work right away. I mean, we really do want Chinese speakers and people that know something about mm -hmm. China, so that when they're mature as journalists, we can send them to China, and they'll you know they'll know they'll know the language, they'll know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will spend a year and a lot of money training them to do that. But obviously. Obviously, people with special backgrounds we want. We want people to know economics and, and all sorts of things like that. But they're still just really talented, interested journalists who just want to make a difference in, in the world yeah. by, by, covering, uh, by covering the news, and we'll hire them, too. One of the interesting things about the Washington Post, and I really don't know if this exists in any other city, you, you, and it's probably because you, apologies to the Times and the Examiner and others, but you are the only big game in town, and you are a beat in itself. I mean, I think it's the Washington City Paper and Washingtonian both have correspondents pretty much assigned just to cover the Washington Post. That's correct. And what's that like for you? Uh, well, it's two different things. Um, I'm not always pleased with what the Washingtonian publishes, uh, yeah. but uh, I have great respect for Eric Wemple, who's the editor of right. the Washington City Paper and covers the Post as part so of his So that for Jaffe, this for Wemple. Okay. You said that. Okay. I said that, right. <laughs> no. Uh, but, like, do you have to have then somebody in your PR department who's just dealing with them, or does no, it just no, fall no. to you? No, no, no. No, we deal with them directly. No, I mean, we're journalists. We expect people to talk expect to us. To be, we should talk right, to people. I don't, right. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't turn anybody it's down. Just I talk that to them. It's just more no comment than. Uh, than uh, well, I, I hardly ever do no comment, but I've been accused of being very careful about what I say. No, that's probably, uh, it's probably a good thing. Now, I made a flip comment uh, before lunch started about investigative journalism not 
happening during the campaign, but that wasn't really what I meant. What I meant was that what happens during a campaign is the people you cover tend to get scared of doing it. You know, the, the, the people who run the country, the people who are running for office all get very careful, and the narrative is sort of beige, and nobody wants to make any big mistakes. But investigative journalism does still go on during the campaign. And do you feel that, in that regard, that these candidates are being vetted as well as they could be? I think they're being vetted better than ever before, mm -hmm. which, of course, causes them to complain about that. Yeah. Uh, because you just go into everything about their backgrounds, which I think is uh, proper for somebody who wants to run the country and have their finger on the button and all those other things. And uh, we have uh, we, we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we dig also into their campaign contributors and their campaign contributions, and and also we have various ways of testing whether or not they're telling American people the truth. We have the we have the fact checker right. and other ways of of, uh, of looking into the things they say and do to make sure that they're uh, uh, that they're being uh, straight with their with their voters. Are you trying to find out who the contributors are, to, for example, to the Clinton Library? Yes, of course. And not waiting for the Clintons to. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, are you close? Yes, of course. You are. Yes, no, of course. No, are we close? <laughs> I, I can't say that. But we we're looking at everything. Everything yeah. that's relevant to whether or not you ought to be president of the United States. How much uh, uh, garbage on each other do they bring with to to you that uh, then you then have to? Every use? campaign, not just presidential, senatorial, city yeah, council just... has negative researchers who find out all the dirt on the right, other candidate right, right. and then come and tell us about it. And sometimes and it's true and sometimes it? it's not. We look into it. Yeah. Sometimes it's absolutely false mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, or, or it's distorted mm -hmm. or it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something about their private life that has nothing to do with their, with their candidacy for public office. And, of course, the, the uh, hurdle for that gets, gets uh, lower as you get higher mm -hmm. up. But for president, almost everything's relevant. For city council member, maybe other things that would be relevant for a presidential candidate aren't relevant for a city council member. But we, we try to check things out. I mean, the rule is a simple one. Is it true? If it's true, can we prove it? And if we can prove it, is it relevant to their qualifications for office? Um, no doubt you've met all these candidates and on many occasions, and socially probably as well as coming and talking to your editorial board in situations like that. Um, Without stepping too far out of the confines of your role at, at the Post, how do you see these three candidates being good or bad for Washington, D.C.? Good or bad for Washington, D.C.? Um, first of all, I'm not going to state any opinions because I don't do that. I know. I, I, I'm as you know, to I let don't, you off that As hook. you know, I don't even vote uh, okay. for that reason. Um, uh, I, I guess if you're thinking about for Washington, D.C., you mean for the community here as opposed yeah, to the we, capital. Yeah, we, you know, I mean, we who live here. And I, and I mean it both yeah. socially and practically. Right. Because it's been a while since we had a president who was really engaged in what goes on in Washington, D.C. Who, you know, the White House doesn't even have to be there right. is the way right. it feels. And, and, it's been, and that's been for a long time. Uh, you know, the Clintons have a history of being somewhat more involved in the city, I guess, than others. Uh, Obama... Uh, up until a certain event in the Oval Office. And yes, then that's kind correct. Of Obama, I just, we just don't know. I mean, he's a relative newcomer to Washington. I've known John McCain for many years. I don't know what his... But I, we never talked about what his interest is in Washington, D.C. as a community. So I have the slightest idea. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the days of the Nixon White House, the Johnson White House, where they actually had a senior person like Joe Califano, mm -hmm. who was in charge of relationships between the federal government and the city and really got invested in the mm -hmm. city. And I would love to see that again, but I don't know if any of these three candidates would do that. Do you think it's the modern presidency or do you think it's security that makes it this way? I mean, oh, well, I think, I think it's, you know, the presidency is very complicated. I think that uh, but I, I, the bad side of the coin is that all of them run against Washington. I mean, even the Clintons in some ways are running against yeah, Washington. I know, I know. McCain, who's been here forever, running <laughs> yeah, against Washington. And uh, so I, they can't be seen, I don't think, at least until they're reelected the second time, I, they can't be seen as being too cozy with Washington. <laughs> like walking in a park or something yeah, like that? Right. But, 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 it, you know, when but they, security's also a problem. I mean, it, it used to be the president down just, Pennsylvania yeah, Avenue, I right. thought, was just a... Yeah. Terrible thing. And it's harder for them to just go out and have dinner at somebody's house than it used to be, right. obviously. Uh, well, and it's in, in, in a couple of ways. It's just opening night at the Nat Stadium, because the president right. was there, just created an ungodly nightmare. Yeah. And that's, I, that's what I don't, happens now. And I don't, know that, I don't know that we can ever go back. Right. That's why that. McCain tried to try to keep the Secret Service away for as long as he could, because he, he not only didn't want to go through that, he didn't want the people coming to see him to go through that. 
But on a more practical level, do you, do you think that any administration will ever be behind our having statehood? Uh, not necessarily. Certainly not a Republican administration, mm -hmm. uh, because this is a Democratic town. You don't want to give more votes in Congress to a Democratic town. Uh, it, and it's, it's the difference between statehood and congressional representation, of course, is also a large one. Uh, statehood would mean uh, uh, you, you, this was created as a federal enclave. Statehood raises the question of what should the federal government still have control over. Yeah. If we become a state, you carve out a federal enclave, as has been proposed in the past, that's still administered by the federal government mm -hmm. for national reasons. Uh, um, whereas having full representation in Congress does not require that we become a state. And I think that's where the focus is, is full representation in Congress. Now, can you have an opinion about that? Do you? No, I, I, I cannot express opinion about okay. that. Okay. Can you have an opinion on how you think Mayor Fenty's doing in pulling uh, the city together? Uh, I, I find him a fascinating political figure, mm -hmm. just a fascinating guy. I mean, he is a nonstop campaigner. I, I don't know when he sleeps. <laughs> uh, and, Apparently he doesn't need to. Right, and he's just, he's always there, and he's... Um, uh, you know, anything happens, he pops up. Uh, anything we do that interests him, he's on the phone. Yeah. And uh, uh, he's, he's just, he's an amazing guy. Now, we'll see if all that energy translates into good decision making <laughs> right. or not. Did he pick the right police chief? You know, is Michelle Ree going to be able to really succeed where everybody else has failed with the schools? The one thing he's done is give him full backing. He's really stuck his neck all the way out politically. Yeah. We've never and had that's a mayor like that before. No, that's interesting. He's not cautious at all. Uh, <laughs> well, you know. No, but I mean, that's, you know, that's, uh, people will judge whether that's good or bad. Do, do you relate to that in any way? Are you oh, I, may I enjoy talking to him. Oh, me? me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess, uh, I guess I combine a boldness in some ways with uh, caution in other ways. It's, it's hard for me to see that. I guess I'll have to ask the mayor what he thinks yeah, of you. Right. Um, yeah. How, when, how will you measure his success with the schools? How will the Post assess Well, we that? asked Michelle Ree that, actually, how she wants to be measured when she was last at the Post. Mm -hmm. And she said five years. And uh, I think that's probably fair enough. But along the way, there are benchmarks. I mean, mm -hmm. are they going to get the books in the schools? You don't wait for five years for that. Uh, and uh, uh, and how are these, uh, how, how are they going to resolve this middle school, junior high thing that's got parents all concerned? How are they going to close down those schools. These are measurable things as we go along the way. Her management style obviously is very forceful uh, and she wants to move rapidly and while she says she consults widely, and I think she does consult widely, she doesn't wait always for the results of the cons consultation to come back <laughs> before she moves. And, and I can understand why she believes that, that mm. she just has to break this, uh, this cycle of never getting anything really accomplished. But as a result, it means we're going to see a lot of decision points pretty rapidly. We'll see whether some of these things she's doing very rapidly are working or not. But certainly, you've got to wait five years to know if test scores are improving and, and that sort of thing, because it's a big, big ocean liner to turn around. Uh, do you live in the city? Yes, I do. Did you raise your children here? Uh, I've had several different families of children. Okay. And they uh, use the D.C. schools? And uh, uh, one set of children went to D.C. schools, yes. And how did you find that experience? Uh, it, uh, it, it, it was fine but it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Yes. And, and it was interesting, you know, Dr. Ree herself has children in D.C. schools, mm -hmm. and when we asked her about what the parent experience is like, she had complaints as a school <laughs> superintendent about, about how things went when she enrolled her kids right. and when school opened. She had complaints that she right. said, stated publicly there in the yeah. newspaper. Now, I remember talking to somebody from Verizon once who said they had to wait on the same tech support line as the rest of us. And I yeah. said, then I can't believe you haven't blown the whole thing up. <laughs> but, uh, um, anyway, that's another subject. Um, the, 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 the mayor, the, he, he succeeds at the schools. Let's say he succeeds at the schools. What would you want to see him tackle after that? I, again, I'm not going to give the mayor advice or okay, well, tell you but, advice. But, but, well, okay, well, when you look at the city, what do you see as a gaping? I, 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 well, I think the, you know, the issues facing him are obvious. Uh, uh, schools, crime, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, transportation, uh, as revealed by what's going on with the stadium, mm -hmm. and, uh, and having development even out over the city. Obviously, you know, what happens on the other side of the Anacostia River? Uh, and, and he's got some big issues facing you know, what's immediately across the river from the stadium, for example. And, and now two new issues, obviously. One will be the finances of the city, again, as all the jurisdictions in this area are facing because of what's going on in mm -hmm. the credit crunch and the credit markets uh, and, the, uh, and home valuations. All the home valuations are holding 
coming up better in the city, there's still going to be a financial crunch for the city. And the other is, uh, is development going to slow down? All these cranes we see out there, yeah. some of them are standing over uh, building uh, construction areas that are now stopped because yeah. there's no more money. Well, we're about to go through a, a, a retail flux here in Georgetown. There's a lot of big ones like Gap and, and uh, uh, Ann Taylor and others are pulling out, and who knows what's going to come in. You know, the, you feel it in, in so many ways. Um, you are in a position, probably unique, beyond even politicians in this area, and that you're not just looking at D.C., you're looking at Virginia, Maryland, mm -hmm. you're looking at this whole metro area. Uh, beyond, I know you're looking at the world, but I'm just thinking of Washington mm -hmm. right now. What do you see as the sort of the, the, the leading uh, regional story right now? Um, I have something in mind, but I just wondered what you... Uh, well, you know, I've always seen a whole bunch. Uh, I, I, I think uh, education's in the forefront. Transportation's very much in the forefront. What about immigration? And immigration, of course, yes. And uh, I, I think those are the big three. Mm -hmm. and, and they're interrelated. And do you see Virginia changing politically at a more rapid rate than Maryland? Pockets of it are. Uh, well, Virginia was always... I mean, we just saw in the primary yeah. that right. it was it was different. It was shape-shifting in a way that I think... Uh, Northern expect. Virginia is becoming more democratic as it becomes more urban. That's, mm -hmm. not, that's not a surprising thing. And as it becomes more diverse in its population. On the other hand, Northern Virginia also seems to be where, the, where there's been the most friction between uh, new immigrants, illegal or illegal, and some of the older citizenry. And whether or not that's going to have a kind of... Uh, whether that's going to affect what, what had become a, a growing democratic vote there or not is going to be very interesting to see in the fall. Um, when you get to, now, you have a new publisher. Yes. Who, but I say new publisher, but it's the same old family. I, I wouldn't say the same old family. I'd say the but, same great family. No, she, well, the same. <laughs> but, but I mean the, that. No, and the Graham family has owned the paper how long now? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. Eugene Meyer bought the Washington Post at bankruptcy in 1933 and invested millions of his own dollars in it. He lost money for a very, very long time. Uh, and he established the values that we still adhere to today, an independent newspaper, uh, independent news gathering, which is why I don't impose my, I don't have views and don't impose them on our mm -hmm. news gathering. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, his son-in-law took over, uh, Phil Graham, mm -hmm. and then upon his death, did Catherine you, did Graham you took ever, over. Did, did you work with Phil Graham? No, I did not. That was before uh, your time. Uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. I, I started the paper in 64, mm -hmm. full-time in 65, mm -hmm. and uh, by that time, Catherine Graham was, uh, was, mm -hmm. uh, was already publisher. Uh, and then her son, Don, and then his nephew, uh, uh, Catherine Weymouth, is the but, current publisher. But you have worked for all three in a management capacity. Yes, yes. And uh, take us through the, the three personalities. Uh, uh, Catherine Graham was a citizen of the world, mm -hmm. uh, just an, Im an immensely impressive woman. And yet, at the same time, uh, uh, very, very modest, amazingly modest. She, this is what her book is all about, personal mm -hmm. history. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. And she fully reveals herself in it. Uh, uh, she, uh, two, two things really stand out, I guess, when you ask a question like that. One is when I was a relatively young editor, the deputy metro editor, uh, working on Saturdays uh, 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 as part of my week uh, a long time ago. She also worked on Saturdays, and she would come down to the newsroom and pick up about half a dozen of us and take us out to lunch. Where? Uh, just across the street at the coffee shop at the Madison right, Hotel. Right, the Madison. Of and, uh, and, of course, I would pay because I was the senior most per per person in this young group because Mrs. Graham never had money. <laughs> uh, and, and you uh, always did. Right. And, uh, uh, and she, uh, uh, she would ask about everything we were doing, and she was knowledgeable about everything and we were doing. And in an intimate, casual way. Yes. Right? And, and then we would, she would always conclude lunch by saying, what's Ben doing now? She always wanted the latest gossip on Ben. Uh, Did she ask about Sally too? Uh, some of that was before. That was oh, before okay, Sally's before, time. Okay, yeah, Sally before and Sally, and that came later, and right? And that came later. Um, and then the other thing that I recall is when she What's won the Pulitzer ben Prize yeah. for her book, Personal History. She won the Pulitzer Prize for biography. And what happens on Pulitzer Days, like this Monday, is we sit in the newsroom and we watch the bulletins come across the wire. Although now it's on a computer, starting at 3 p.m. and um, she and, and the late Meg Greenfield, who was in the editorial mm -hmm. page. They were best friends, the paper, right? Yes, and mm -hmm. myself were crowded around the computer watching it. And it finally came over, and you could see that until that moment, she hadn't really grasped that she had won the Pulitzer Prize. She didn't and have Meg your turned to her and said, do you believe it now? <laughs> and Catherine, and Ka Catherine said, yeah, I think so. Oh, my God. What a sweet moment yeah. that had to be. 
Um, did you hug her? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Um, but I guess you haven't hugged Donnie Graham, though. I know, I know we've, we've yeah, hugged a lot this week. You have a hugged fact. a lot we this week. Several <laughs> times on Monday, yes. So uh, what was the transition like from Catherine to him? Uh, you know, they, they both have the same values. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd known Don for a long time. When I was a really young editor in 1970, an assistant city editor, a new reporter was assigned to me, and his name was Don Graham. I was just going to say, it they was, all come up yeah, through the... It was when he was going through various mm -hmm. jobs, and so he worked for me for about nine months, covering the fire department, as I recall. Well, he had been a cop, General right? Before and he had that. been a cop before yeah. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I first got to know him. And, uh, um, and I didn't cut him any corners or do him any favors, which I guess you remembered. So he, he took an interest in my career as we went through the years. So I, You were sort of auditioning in a way, weren't you? Uh, well, I, 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 that didn't feel like it at the time because okay. I was a relatively new editor, so just keeping up with my, figuring yourself. out how to be an editor was enough okay. of a challenge for me. So you're just another reporter mm -hmm. by and large. Um, and uh, so we, we, we had a lot of contact through the mm -hmm. years. So when he became publisher, it was a fairly seamless transition. We had known each other for a long time. Now, you have probably known Catherine since she was an itty-bitty. Uh, yeah, but not that well because she was doing other things. She became a lawyer. She worked for Williams and Connolly. Right. So I really got to know her when she came to the newspaper and joined our legal But staff. you all knew she was in the pipeline, so to speak. Uh, sort of... I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say before then, not mm -hmm. necessarily, no. And she no. did the same thing, working her way yes. through different... But yes, but she think... never worked in the newsroom because even she and I schemed to have her work in the newsroom, but Don always found, and he needed her, in various business uh, positions, and so she never was able to work in She was largely in, in advertising, right? Or yes, class? Yeah. yes. Yeah. After being after being on our legal staff, when when did when did you two start like getting to know each other, knowing that that she would be taking this job? I mean, did you two o only start? only recently? Only I mean, recently. we we got to know each other, but in right. our other roles, when she was vice president for advertising, obviously she, we had a lot of mm -hmm. uh, uh, business to do back and forth mm -hmm. about uh, you know what kind of advertising we put in the paper. Are we going to put? You know, some advertisers want their ads in the middle of yeah. stories and things like that. So we had a lot of that kind of traffic, and I came to respect her very quickly. I, but it's um, only recently she became publisher and that that relationship has been established. Here on my Blackberry is an email I had from her that I wanted to read to you. Uh, it's about your Pulitzer. <laughs> she said, it is a very nice boost for morale in the newsroom and a great credit to Len. I thought that was very nice. It is very nice. It is very nice. Uh, what do you two um, talk about the most these days, though? Oh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, Can you share I, some of it with us? Well, you know, obviously we have an early retirement offer to the staff now, yeah. which is going to further reduce the size of the staff. We need to talk about that. Uh, uh, she now is the first publisher to be in charge of both the website and the newsroom. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the relationships between the newsroom and the website and, uh, you know, just lots of other things. I mean, just a million things to deal with. Do you talk about your successor? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I know you're not I mean, going to talk about it. She and I are but talking about the future, and that, that includes, I mean, she's got to have her own editor at some point, and I've got to retire at some point. So Without naming names, but let's just, you know, in the general realm of this, is it, is it, is it, do, do you talk about somebody who maybe has one foot in the, in the website of the post? You're a really good questioner, Karen. <laughs> but you didn't hire me, no. But, um, <laughs> But, I'm but, sorry about that. No, it's okay. As I said, there was more to the story. But um, but uh, 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 I don't want to get off my train of thought here because I'm just remembering that day. But um, uh, but but realistically, uh, when you look at the crop of potentials, I mean, there, there, there's got to be an advantage to somebody who really does understand. I mean, at some point, I got an email from one of your staff who says. The web paper relationship is as highly dysfunctional as it is essential. At the top levels, the ties across the river have gotten much better. But in the Correct. lower and middle ranks, we remain worlds apart. I think worlds apart is an exaggeration. This is probably well, it's somebody who works yeah, for well, you. Yeah, it's probably somebody, <laughs> and it's probably somebody who's had their own difficulties of communication. Right. These are two different cultures. Don and I decided at the outset that that culture had to grow up on its own yeah. and had to grow up in the web world. I mean, if you turned to me to run a website 10 years ago, that would have been a terrible mistake. Uh, so they had to grow up in their own worlds. The newspaper was decidedly unwebby 10 years ago. Yeah. Now the newsroom is very webby. It's full of young people that live in that world and yeah. have exciting ideas and so on. And yet, 
and they want to do things. And yet there's this other culture across the river at WashingtonPost.com that's in charge of doing those things. Naturally, you're going to have some tensions. Now we're going to bring the two together in some way. I mean, I mean, Could Kath you ever see Catherine's having you the, in the same physical th plant? That's possible. These are the kind of decisions that Catherine's going to have to make. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, at some point, uh, I'm more involved with them for one thing. I mean, I think our political coverage... You do oversee them. Uh, no, I don't oversee them. I, I, I work with them. Okay. And obviously, since I've been around forever, there's a certain amount of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of grace that they give me in I dealing with hope. them. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, uh, I think our political coverage on the web and in the newspaper demonstrates how closely we can work together. It is now seamless cooperation. And I'm working to mediate that kind of seamless cooperation in everything that we do. And, and it's, a, it's a process. It's in, it's in process. Okay. Well, when you decide, you can come back and talk to me about it. But before we're done, I'd love to, I really would like to find out about your novel because I understand it is a novel because yes. you have written, you have written nonfiction yes. in the past. You've published many successful nonfiction, but this is a novel. Is this like, uh, you know, you hear always journalists have their novel in their desk drawer right. forever. Is this that novel that's been in your desk well, drawer? Well, I had an idea in my mind for a long time. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I thought I could never write fiction because I don't have much of an imagination. But it turned oh. out that when this idea occurred to me, the last book, that last nonfiction book I did with Bob Kaiser was right. The News About the News. Uh, and just before we got that idea to do that book, I had this idea for a novel. And I literally did put it in a drawer. It was like a page, uh -huh. a, a page idea uh, uh, How you had time, I can't even imagine. And then we did this other book. Mm -hmm. And then we finished the book. I went back and took the file out and read the page. And I thought, hmm, there's something there. And I figured out I could do it largely from my own experience. I don't have to have an imagination. So it's a Washington novel? Of course, it's a Washington novel. Is it a love story? A, there's, there's love in it no. and other things. Sex? Uh, yes. Okay, good. How yeah. was that first yeah. time writing a yeah. sex scene? Uh, very awkward. And, and my agent and my editor said, very awkward. <laughs> so I had to work on that. You must have succeeded because I hear you sold it to Knopf. Yes, so. Knopf's going to publish it sometime <laughs> early next year. The working title is the uh, is the rules of the game, okay. and it's about uh, investigative Newspaper reporting, okay. and it's about uh, politics, and it's about uh, uh, espionage and a lot of stuff. So all Marty together. Wiles in it after all. Now. <laughs> Um, is this any kind of glimpse into Len Downey's life after the post? Well, I've already got an idea for another novel, so I will continue so to write maybe, fiction. So when people we'll say you've happens. got to find out from, what, from him what he's going to do when he leaves the post, is this, would this be an ideal um, sort of pasture to be I, in? There are a lot of writing? books that I want to write, fiction and nonfiction, and uh, there might be other things I want to do too whenever that, when that time comes. Uh, what do you love more or both? Lo what, what's, what's your first love, news or words? Uh, I have to say that the news is probably my first love. Uh, uh, I'm learning how to love words. Uh, I, I, was, I was always a reporter first. I was an investigative reporter for many years. Mm -hmm. And writing is sort of secondary to most investigative reporters. That's why I have such ad admiration for Bart Gelman uh, mm -hmm. and Joe Becker, who wrote the Cheney series, because they're both great wordsmiths as well as great diggers. I was a digger first and learned how to deal with words. And actually being an editor helped me because you get to work with all these great writers mm -hmm. and you pick up things from them over the years. And now I'm much more comfortable with words. But it's still, it's more of a struggle than it's, I mean, editing is very easy for me. In fact, I've been through this experience with the book. I was learning how to be a novelist, obviously, and I'm mm -hmm. still learning. But I went through a number of drafts. Each draft, when I finished it as the writer, I thought, that's pretty nice. Turn it into my editor, and he would send me back <laughs> about two paragraphs that completely tore it to pieces. And but first, I'd be now very depressed and figure like. I got to stop this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then secondly, I would I'd go back and look at it and say, wait a minute. I see exactly what he's talking about. The <laughs> editor in my head would kick in. Okay. And then that would send me through my next draft. So I'm still at that point where I'm partly the writer and partly the editor, and I hope to become more writer over time. When did you find time to write it? It was a hobby, so I did it only when I felt like it. It wasn't a nonfiction book. It didn't have a deadline. I didn't Were have you to, a time I didn't writer, have to a morning writer? Sometimes I get up early in the morning, sometimes in any other time. Right. And my wife was very, very nice to me to allow me to spend a lot of our weekends at the, at the computer with screen. You, with you, uh, on a computer, very good. Um, now, let me ask you this. Uh, have you already decided who gets to review it at the Post? No, I don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Certainly not in this we, case. We, so many of us at the Post are authors yeah. that we give Book World complete independence. Not so many of you at the Post or the boss. 
Yeah, <laughs> but, but we give, uh, at any rate, Book World has complete independence. What Marie Arano, the editor of Book World, figured out the last time with the book, The News right, About the, the News, was she got somebody essentially to do a book report on it. It described what the book was about and never expressed an opinion about it. <laughs> well, there you go. I thought that was pretty clever. That should be interesting. Well, um, do us a favor when you have your novel, come back. I would love to. Uh, thank you very much. It's been great having you here. And again, congratulations for a really big win. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.